मन और मुख का मौन बखूबी ना दे तुमने धारा है महक रहा है आज भी तुमसे सम सदा रहे तुम जग से न्यारी प्यारे संगम पर भी लगते थे तुम दिव्य राज कुमारे तभी तो बाबा ने भी आप पर अपना सब कुछ वारा है मन और मुख का मौन बखूबी एक तुमने ही धारा कदम पर आपके दादे हम भी चलेंगे प्यार से बन संपूर्ण आपके जैसा जाएंगे संसार से स्नेहा चली दादी आपको स्नेहा चली
and then Shanti to everyone. Welcome. So, Sister Genti, that was a beautiful song dedicated to Daddy Gulzar. And um, we all know Daddy Gulzar sacrifice. In fact, I was thinking these five steps that apply to Brahma Baba also apply to Daddy Gulzar, to all the daddies. Faithful, obedient, surrender, um, renunciate, everything. And they certainly followed Baba's footsteps. And one of the things that um, Daddy always used to say, as you know, Sister Jen, she, you know, it's, it's the body shop uh, logo also, or motto, that if, you're too, if you think you're too small to do anything, then you haven't spent time uh, in bed with a mosquito. And uh, so in a way, Daddy Gulzar used to say that um, just be the incense, the incense stick is so small and yet um, it's able to spread its uh, fragrance everywhere. So Sister Gently, maybe you could also share a bit about Daddy's day and uh, the experience. And of course, the revision of the 13th morning morning. Thank you so much. Om Shanti Aruna and Om Shanti to all my brothers and sisters. And thank you for putting up with all the time changes and everything else that's going on. And yes, on the 13th, it was, um, it was on the 11th, actually. 13th was the Murli, but on the 11th, um, we began with Baba Smurli, and then we all went into um, a lok, uh, a vyak lok, and that was the place which is a beautiful place, very, very lovely, um, absolutely elegant and beautiful and sparkling. And the tower to Daddy is there, Daddy Gulzar, the Tower of Divinity, and we're able to then spend time actually sitting there because the other um, places have a small space where there's a covering, but this is a big space where there's a very beautiful covering. And so you can be out of the heat and the sun and just spend time experiencing the bodiless stage and going to the subtle region. And after that, we had morning program, and very interesting character, somebody who is now currently the Vice Admiral of the Indian Navy and a very key position, as you can imagine. And the Indian Navy is big and he's the Vice Admiral. And so basically he's the Assistant Chief and he practices Amrit Vela, studies morally, and so he He's been following the system of Brahman life for some years now and has met both Daddy Gulzar, Daddy Janki, and also met Abhyak Babdada. So a very special soul playing a special role. And he spoke very beautifully of his experiences with the Daddies and Daddy Gulzar in particular, and also his experience of Brahman life and how that's helping him have a very clear mind and a steady focused concentration. So interesting um, person to be there for Daddy's Day. And then of course, we offered Bhog to Baba and Moini Ben was the instrument to offer Bhog. And something that certainly I wasn't expecting happened. And the first thing we noticed was the hand of blessings. So from just sitting there offering pork, then we saw the hand go up and drishti. And we were then asked to come up and take drishti from Dadiji. And the drishti was very, very much daddy, or even Baba, I would say, because daddy's drishti by the end was like Baba's drishti. And that drishti, was absolutely stable and focused and powerful and extremely concentrated. 
and after that the sisters wanted daddy to say something and daddy went to the cameras daddy just signaled and everybody parted and daddy G spoke of baba's love the message was yes the love for the family but the other one was that of unity that of having harmony with each other so that was very very significant a big message to all of us and then of course um it was just a very short um few words by daddy ji and then when mohini ben came back she shared um how baba and daddy kulsar were having chit chat and baba was saying you see everyone's here for you and daddy was saying no baba they're here for you and that exchange of love between them and so i'm sure you would have received that message by now so it was um a very historic experience for me in the sense that um it gave me a very powerful signal that baba is still intervening directly in whatever is going on in the yagya and why i say that is because so many people now say well you know it's a revision of the murlis is a revision of the sakar murlis even the transmission is revision and so what newness is there well this was something uh, quite incredibly powerful and unique and very very unusual and so baba seeing what is the mood of the children and what intervention needs to happen in that way so i think it was a big boost for all and of course many people have lots of hopes that this is going to be a new role for sister mohini and let's see the drama i asked her directly is this the beginning of a new chapter and she smiled and said well one can never say no but um it's not a part that i've usually played and so let's see but anyway it was a very beautiful scene to be present at and yes um it was about 15000 people that were there um i think maybe by then actually 15000 was the figure i saw for morning breakfast and then for lunch i saw 17000 as the figure that was given but i think many people might have come from gujarat just for the day so that might explain it and then of course with baba smurli yesterday again it was at least 17 if not more thousand um because of course all the um uh, participants had come from uh, all the different complexes also but it was packed 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 full and it's become um a very lovely feeling of how post covid everybody is returning back to madhuban and i think it was about 300 double foreigners that were here yesterday some of course have already left this morning um so some people even leave madhuban after baba has left and so it's it's an exodus at first it's people coming in then it's baba and then it's people were leaving and going out so it's very interesting watch the uh, ebb and flow of the tide in a sense and the murli yesterday morning it's connected very much with the 18th january murli because this was on the 20th of january 1990 and baba is talking about the five steps and baba made it so simple you know just remember five things and you can become bab saman but of course the one who loves all the souls of the world or seeing his loving children those who are equal and close and baba mentioned how the children who are close and equal are the ones who want to follow in baba's footsteps baba also was very beautifully explaining how shiv baba the incorporeal decided to choose an instrument in the corporeal form 
like Brahma Baba, who's been through the whole cycle of 84 births and has that recording within the soul. And so Baba chose him so that he could be a model. He could be an excellent example and show the children how easy it was, how simple it was to become like the father. And so the loving father decided to offer an example who could, be, who could show the easy path to everyone and make everybody aware that, yes, it's possible for a human being to achieve all of this. And Baba said, well, I'm going to tell you in essence, and in, of course, there's a lot of detail to each one of those points, and I'm sure you must be reflecting and churning all of those things. But the first point, the one who renounces everything, the body, bodily relations, but most of all, the first renunciation was of the mind and intellect, so that then there was only Baba and Srimad in his awareness at all times. And if I do this, if I first and foremost renounce the eye of my mind and my intellect, then it's easy to renounce the bodily relations and even the body itself to forget about all of these things. But this first step of renunciation is to renounce the mind and intellect and the consciousness of I, but to surrender both of these to God. And then the second one, and the second one of total, total obedience. Every thought, every word, every action was according to Srimad. And this is a unique soul in the drama who plays that part of mother and father of the Yajna and is able to sustain the Yajna and carry out this huge task of establishment, but yet is able to be detached and loving. And so obedience in all aspects. And then the third one, that of being totally faithful, just as a faithful wife would not have a single thought or a dream about anyone else. There would only be the consciousness of belonging to one. And so for Brahma Baba, absolutely the faithful one. And so many, many challenges coming, but always that awareness of one strength and one support and being able to follow whatever it is that that one is showing and do, asking me to do, to be ever present in front of that one. And then the world server, this amazing instrument who became the one who was the instrument for establishment, the one who was able to show a new path and even with all the opposition that came about, whether it was the leaders of religion, the leaders of government, um, leaders of any type, he had the power of truth. And so he was fearless. His courage immense and his strength so powerful that he did not shake for a moment, but was able to remain stable as an instrument absolutely in that awareness of humility and yet the authority of truth. It's a very interesting paradox to be able to have the authority of truth and be fearless, but yet at the same time have total humility. And yet this was the instrument who was able to manage that so beautifully. And because of that, of course, the foundation was so strong that it's led to everything else that's happened since then. And then the fifth one, the one who is absolutely, absolutely beyond the pull of karma, free from the bondage of karma, free from the bondage of relationships, free from everything 
so that in the final moment, one signal, and he was able to fly, and he was able to come to that state of just the awareness of one and no attachments anywhere at all. And so very powerful summary of the whole of Baba's life from the beginning all the way through till that final moment. Um, I was fascinated how Baba tracked everything down to these five steps. Um, you know, if somebody were to ask us to summarize the whole of Brahma Baba's life in five sentences, would we be able to do that? And yet Shiv Baba, of course, the almighty, the ocean, the intellect of the wise is able to do everything. Baba is able to speak of Murali, which is for three hours and capture our attention all the time. And Baba is able to summarize the whole lifetime of someone in just five sentences. So that was fascinating for me. And then Baba asking us, are we following in one or two or all of these steps? And of course, Arunaben mentioned how we saw the daddies, each one of the daddies follow in this. And so that gives me an indication of who the eight jewels are. I mean, it wasn't a realization now, but um, just that comment um, made me connect it up with this, that if you're thinking about the eight jewels, then surely it is the ones who followed in Baba's footsteps. And so the ones who followed in all five of those footsteps, definitely the eight jewels. And so each one of us to check ourselves to see where we are at. And then further, Baba saying that to what extent do you have the same qualities as Baba? And the one thing that Baba picked on, Baba mentioned several different qualities, but Baba picked up on one in particular, and that is unlimited. So do you stay in the limit, limited or are you able to be in the unlimited? Is there the consciousness of I and mine? Is there the consciousness of my center, my students? my project, my area, my anything. And a little bit of background here, just a little while earlier than 1990, um, pre-Om Shanti Bhavan days, we had the meditation hall, but not Om Shanti Bhavan, that was under construction. And I remember stopping in India on my way back from somewhere in the east, back and forth from there to London. And in those days, you could stop over for a few days and it was easy. And so I did that. And it was a teacher's meeting that was taking place. And to my surprise, I saw how everybody was given a map and they were asked to sit within their particular region. And then they were asked themselves to discuss between each other and within that region to see how to um, demarcate areas that they would be serving in. Because there'd been a little bit of a hoo-ha about uh, which area, which zone, which city, and which within a city, you know, for example, like Delhi. Delhi has about 40 different centers, Bombay the same, any, any big city in India. And it's so big, the population is so huge that they have areas that they're serving in and then they collaborate, of course. And so Baba said that, yes, there are areas that have been demarcated, um, but yet is your consciousness unlimited? Is there the awareness that I'm a benefactor, not just of my center, of my area, but I'm a world benefactor. And so, what is the consciousness that I have that the whole world is my family, that all of Baba's work is my responsibility and wherever it is, I can give a finger of support to somebody else. Am I able to do that? 
And Baba then using this word abundance. And within that, that idea that the Bandara and the Bandari, the Bandara, um, Baba's kitchen, and whether that's overflowing and abundant, and the Bandari, Baba's box, is that overflowing and abundant? And if I have a big heart, if I have an unlimited consciousness, then yes, everything will be overflowing, there will be abundance. And if I don't have a big heart, if I'm limited in my heart, in my thinking, in my feelings, then there won't be the same outcome. There, there might even be a shortfall, of course, but particularly it means that there won't be that feeling of generosity and fulfillment and the results that we would like to see happen. And so a very, very powerful signal. Am I thinking about the world and bringing benefit for the world? Or am I thinking just about my own limited space and area and region? And of course, within that, the whole concept of I and mine coming in, and that's going to be very, very restrictive. And it's not going to allow Baba's energy to flow through and make things happen. And then the second thing that Baba wanted us to pay attention to, and that was the subject of balance. And the balance between my own attention to the self and then also my attention to service out there, whether it's world service <coughs> or service in my area or my region, but service out there. And so Baba explaining very carefully that if there is service, that doesn't allow you to stay happy and keep your stage, then that service isn't going to be successful. And so not to get so engrossed in service that I lose awareness of what I need to do for myself inside. And there was a very lovely expression that Baba used that there are two things to pay um, great attention to in Brahman life. And that is, and you have to do this lifelong. And first is attention. And the second is practice. And so keep focused and having attention and keep practicing. So your practice of yoga, not just, well, I've been practicing yoga for a long time now, so I don't need to bother anymore. No, that's going to be big time, Maya. And so practice keep practicing, keep practicing, and attention. But not that it's attention that's creating tension, but just simply awareness and that checking that's needed within. Because otherwise, what's going to be the outcome? If it's just service out there without attention on the self, what is going to be the end result for me? And what is going to be the power or the capacity with which I can serve? And another bit I'll just throw in the earlier section of the unlimited. Baba had also spoken about how um, where if there isn't that attention of the unlimited and there's just the concern about my centers and the number of centers and the number of students. And Baba said that numbers are not the game. It's not numbers that's going to take you to to heaven. It's going to be the quality of what it is you've done and the unlimitedness of your own consciousness that's going to take you to heaven and claim whatever right it is you have for whatever number in heaven. And so really services is going to happen, but I need to have attention on myself. So it's not a numbers game. It's not even a question of you know, how far have I spread my wings in terms of service and claimed territory 
as my territory, nothing to do with that. But it's my stage. And also on the basis of that, to what extent have inspired others to come to that same level. And I was saying that just as in anything that you do, when you're thinking about service, it's not just the external budget, but you have to check your spiritual budget. And within the budget, also your savings account. And so I was said, in terms of spiritual budget, you need to check your time, your thoughts, your energy, your breath, what's happening with all of this. And you, you can see how all of this is absolutely connected with the attention on the self. But also Baba mentioned the thing that Baba had brought about brought up a few weeks ago and how Baba had given the signal about words. And I was just reflecting on that for a moment and thinking that um, when you get too busy, then that mantra that Baba reminded us of a few weeks ago, and that was speak less, speak softly, and speak sweetly. Now speak less. I need to be able to manage my thoughts so that I'm finding the essence and not letting my mind get into streams of expansion going here and there. And if my thoughts are confused, if my thoughts are expanded, then of course my speech is going to be the same. So speaking less means I'm actually thinking less I'm aware of the power of my thoughts and not to allow them to go astray, but I'm able to clarify things and come to the essence and then be able to share the essence. So fewer thoughts, fewer words, so less words, but yet able to carry that same essence of significance so that there's clarity and no confusion. And then secondly, soft, speak softly. When we get busy in service, what is the tone of my voice? Does the volume go higher and higher and reach a state where I'm shouting or even screaming? Why? Surely that's not what I came to Baba for. I did not come to Baba for this. And so soft, soft volume. Um, the daddies would give a signal. I would expect us to understand. And they would be surprised when we didn't understand their signals. And so daddy would sometimes say, but I signaled to you. Did you not understand? How come you didn't pick up my signal? So to be able to have such clarity that I'm able to communicate just very softly to have that spiritual authority where even a few words, soft words can make a difference. I remember Dadiji when it used to be the time for meeting with Baba and you know people would be excited, people would be singing, when it was something that was interesting that was happening on the stage. And then Daddy would just raise her hand. That's all she did. She raised her hand and the whole gathering would become quiet. I don't know how many of you witnessed this, but I must have witnessed this many times. Just one hand, a signal. And she didn't take the microphone and shout to the top of her voice and say, quiet, please, just a signal. That the Janki, when she'd enter a gathering and they'd be chatting, 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 mingling, networking, and her presence, again, would make everybody quiet and still. So authority isn't expressed by a loud voice, but to have spiritual authority and to be able to put across my message softly, it's possible. And then thirdly, speak sweetly. And in that, of course, sweetness, not artificially, 
But truly, when I've cleaned out the soul and there's no more lust, anger, greed, attachment, ego, and all of these, of course, change the tone of my voice, the volume of my voice. But then with that total cleanliness and purity, there would be sweetness in the words also, and every word would be invaluable. So Baba had noticed, of course, that sometimes in the busyness of service, we speak harshly, or we speak too quickly, we're not able to communicate clearly, and problems arise in relationships. And so Baba's sweet reminder, Baba's made you aware of the power of words, Baba's explained to you what it is you need to do in terms of service. And of course, then Baba talking about the budget. And within that, Baba was actually speaking to everybody. Um, and Baba's then pointing out how it's a time for unlimited service. And it's still the time for global cooperation, of course, you mean. It's, it's amazing how much personal attention Baba gave to that project. So Baba actually very um, graphically describing what it is we need to do. Bring professionals, bring together a small group, bring together um, a larger group if you want. You can have a big program if you want. You can have a small program if you don't want to manage a big program. So Baba giving us opportunity. Baba saying it's time for freedom in service. And yes, 1990 was a time in which a huge amount of service expansion happened. And yes, there were little groups. And yes, there were big programs. All of that happened. And Baba saying that do all of this, but within all of that, don't forget your own stage. And so a time for service, but Baba's caution. This is the method with which you do service. Don't just do service, full stop, but do it according to the right method. And so, again, a memory, many, many memories awoken through this particular morally because it was describing so graphically all the things that those of us who were around at that time were going through. So the five steps, but out of that then, special signals from Baba for all of us. So that's the summary of the morning. Thank you, gentlemen. You're always so succinct. <laughs> um, so, gentlemen, just um, off the heels of your talk, um, Sometimes, gentlemen, this, you're not speaking softly business. Um, I, I feel like, <laughs> if I be honest, I feel like sometimes it, it feels artificial because sometimes people are really trying to be very yogi and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it actually cheeses you up, you know? So there's a fine uh -huh. line between being natural, uh, uh -huh. being happy and jovial and all that. Um, oh. But I, I do feel sometimes, gentlemen, it is somebody trying to be a yogi, and you can pick that. <laughs> um, you know, when somebody's a yogi, not trying to be a yogi, when somebody is in yoga and they're keeping that awareness, then the way that they speak is very definitely different to the usual way. So let me be able to support that. And if they're trying to be a yogi, okay let me give the marks for even at least trying um but yes natural is one thing and then where i get head up and the voice changes and the volume goes higher um that's what baba's reminding us of so baba asked that question earlier also of course um subhav what is your original state of being and feeling so not just say well this is my nature this this is how I am. Um, because no, you can have a loud voice, but if it's natural loud, then there's no animosity or edge to it. Then there's still a very good feeling about it. But if I know that that's not your normal tone, you've raised it, then of course I also know that there's something else that's interfering. 
Yes, true, gentlemen, thank you. Um, I wanted to just mention um, when it, this thing about opposition of Baba and how Baba stayed so stable. I wanted to mention how even his business partner, Sevakram, Sevakram Kupchan Daswani. And I don't know if you know, gentlemen, that um, he actually, well, he turned against, but he actually made a formal, um, what do you call it, a statement saying that I've known him for 35 years and he learned some magic from a sage that we met eight years ago. And thereafter he sent him 10,000 rupees and that's why he closed the business. I mean, all of it was fake because I've also looked into it. Um, but still, you know, but still Brahma Baba didn't have any feeling of, you know, animosity towards him or hatred or, I mean, he was amazing in this sense of putting up with opposition and flack. And yet, <laughs> as, we, as Baba said, you know, humble and uh, truth following the, the path of truth and yet being humble and having that authority. So I just yeah. wanted to mention yeah, how great yeah. Baba is. Um, but also, gentlemen, I thought to take up this aspect first um, of the big heart. And uh, we know Baba had big heart, Mama had big heart, Daddy Prakashmani had big heart, Daddy Janki had big heart, we have seen it. And I do feel it is the key to service and, and to bringing souls closer. And if we, you know, share your story, Sister Jenti, um, you used to go and have a little lunch with Daddy Janki and she had very little, but it was her big heart. So I do believe um, the big heart is the key, but again, how, gentlemen, how to cultivate that and how to see the importance of it, especially in centers. And, and this also, gentlemen, goes... Um, well, a lot can be said about centers, you know, sometimes just feeding somebody, just giving them food if they can't manage for a while, if they're sick, to just provide them a meal once a day. I mean, all this is part of the big heart, isn't it? It so is. Maybe it is. Can, if you can yeah, elaborate on that, I think that's important. Um, I think a bit big heart starts with little things, like you've said, um, where I see there's a need to be able to try and fulfill that where I see that I can support somebody in, by giving a little bit of food, a little bit of extra time and attention. Sometimes it's not even anything physical. Sometimes it's just giving your time. Um, and that makes a big difference. So whatever I see is the need at that point. Am I able to just stretch my boundaries and say, okay, let me help them in whatever way it is I can. And then, of course, it comes to a little bit of a bigger situation. I see that there's a center that has a need. Can I expand my boundaries and see in what way I can support them? And if I can't support them myself personally, can I think of somebody who could support them and make that connection between A and B so that the center is able to receive help from this other individual? You know, so often if there is somebody who has that sort of financial capacity, then I think, well, you know, they're already helping this center. So how can I talk to them about that center? But maybe if I do talk to them about that center, they would be able to manage to support that center too. And so the big heart means that not necessarily that I can do everything for another center, but I can open the door and allow things to happen for the other individual to help there or where they come to me, you know, like it happens so often with daddy. Somebody would come to daddy and say, daddy, I've just had a bonus or daddy, I've just had an inheritance. What do I want? What should I do with it? And so, um, of course, Baba didn't mention Madhuban. Baba was talking about centers, basically. But in fact, is there something I can do to support Baba's big home, Madhuban? And I know that during COVID times, a large number of Baban, but can we support Madhuban in some way? And they really tried to find a way to support Madhuban. But I also know that during COVID times, 
um, many, many centers would provide meals to people who are very vulnerable and within the neighborhood, and they would be given those meals. Um, they would arrange, I know that there's a whole number of people around Global House, elderly folk, and they would cook specially extra for that. And then they would, there's a brother who took up the responsibility of taking a hot meal to each one of those people every single day during that period. Um, so things like this were happening. And so I think that many, many of Baba's children do have compassion and a big heart. But sometimes what comes in the way is competition. I'm in competition with another individual. And so I want to prove that I can do things better than they. So I don't have the thought of reaching out and helping that center because it's this individual that I'm competing with. But no, nothing to do with that individual. It's Baba's home, it's Baba's center. And so can I support and help them in whatever way it is I can? And so I see how finance is one thing, food is another thing, but also maybe there's talents at my center. And I know that this other center doesn't have people with those skills. Can I say to this individual, it's beautiful that you're helping here, but I wonder if once a week you can give a little bit of time there so that they also benefit from that. And of course, your fortune grows and your relationships develop in that way. And so can I have that generosity of spirit in which I say, let every center flourish, let Baba's work everywhere flourish, and every individual be able to be supported to move to their own highest potential. Yes, gentlemen, and actually a few of our students had given me their ticket for Madhuban because they did, we didn't go, you know, for, for a year and a half. So they said, here's our ticket money and please send that. So you're right. Uh, but right. also service, um, as you were saying, gentlemen, even opportunity for service, right? Like, uh, yeah, you'd be a better person for this, so please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's a big one, isn't it? Here's yeah. an opportunity that seems to be opening up and it's come to me, but maybe there is another person who would avail themselves of that opportunity in a better way than me. Can I have that generosity in which I offer that to another? Yeah. And also, gentlemen, I remember when we would come to you with some donation and then you would say, give it to, you know, you'd always say, give it to Madhubana, give it to Jagatamba Bhavan. And you also were embodying this big heart. So we learned from that. Thank you. So gentlemen, how is that different from being unlimited? Can we move to being unlimited? Because I feel sometimes we want to be unlimited, but then we get scared or we have doubts whether the unlimited will work in terms of, okay, we want to serve everyone. We want to invite everyone. We want to give to everyone, but maybe we can't. So first question is how is unlimited different from big heart? And again, how to, how to make unlimited work? Um, I think for me, unlimited is not having a big program and inviting everyone. Unlimited is really knowing that it's God's work. And let me be aware of that. And I know that God's work has to reach everyone. And so can I be totally impartial and without thinking of one or another in terms of this group or that group? Um, in an unlimited way, I know that I don't have enough space for everyone. But can I also say, okay, today it's this, tomorrow is this, and the next day and the next day, so that people see and it's visible that I am thinking of all of them and not just thinking of one group or another group. And to be able to balance that out, because otherwise it's so easy to become partial and you know, favor this group against that group. I'll give you an example. Sometimes maybe my affinity is with the kitchen. And so I'm calling the kitchen mothers, having a meeting with them, giving them tolly and whatever. But what about the technical team? 
without a technical team, a program couldn't happen. And so these are the invisible people, the light, the sound, and all of those things that are required to make a program happen. And so unlimited means not just thinking about one department, but thinking about all the different departments. And sure, I can't call everyone at the same time. If I could, fine. But if I can't, let me be aware so that then I'm balancing my time and energy but I'm giving the same opportunity of closeness and intimacy and opportunity to all. And so unlimited to really, really make sure that it isn't one group or a few individuals that are being given opportunity all the time. And it's very easy to forget about parts that are unseen in a sense. And so not to think about that, but or even where, you know, where there's mixture of um, different ethnicities and um, backgrounds. But again, to have that unlimited consciousness in which they're my family. I think more than anything else is this feeling of belonging, that they belong here and they have a right to be here and not to be disparaging about them, or put anyone down because they're from a particular background. I think unlimited in a very practical way is part of that. I might not be able to serve the whole wide world and the five continents, but the people who are here, am I able to serve them all equally with the same vision? Or is there an affinity to people who speak my language as distinct to people who speak a different language? But now, of course, they're here and we are one family. But sometimes there's this linguistic thing. Sometimes it's a racial thing. You know, all of these things in a subtle way come in even within the Brahmin family. And Baba, the Dadis never allowed that. If they're giving time to one group today, they'll give time to another group tomorrow. They'll make sure that it's balanced out in that way. Yes, and, and you reminded me of um, the early days where um, Baba refused for them to talk in Sindhi or <laughs> have any, any kind of conversation because that would, you know, put, like keep others out. You know, Baba would say, why do you need to speak in another language? Are you gossiping or something? So be transparent, be open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very so, gentlemen, I really love this line where Baba said, um, why do you become worthy of worship? Because those who stay in their self-respect automatically receive respect from others. And it's, it, it's just, again, pointing out the karmic thing. You, you become worthy, you respect yourself, and others will automatically respect you. But my question to you is, because um, Baba differentiated between body conscious and soul conscious, so what is imperishable soul consciousness? And could you talk a bit about that? Imperishable soul is, the soul is imperishable, but imperishable soul consciousness is where that's what I'm aware of more and more and more. It begins right from the first day I come to Baba and I practice this idea of I, the soul, but then to what extent am I able to maintain that through the day? Am I so busy that I forget about soul consciousness? Am I so engaged in whatever it is I'm doing that I'm not checking what is the consciousness that I'm in? And that state of being aware of who I am as a child of God, and so having that awareness of my own elevated status, not just as a soul or even an imperishable soul, but a child of God, a soul who has this fortune of recognizing Baba and connecting with Baba. And so how valuable am I in that awareness? And when I forget that, then of course, Baba was talking about the whole thing where even if there's a president or a prime minister, the body gets the soul leaves the body and the status gets lost with that also. But 
that awareness of soul and in that eternal consciousness of I, the soul, the child of God, a soul who belongs to the deity clan, and connected with my own inner core values, then those core values make me valuable. And so recognizing my own value, and I'm not needy. You see, the problem is that when I don't have that inner self-respect, not only is it that I'm craving for respect from others or I'm seeking respect from others, but more than that, it's this state of neediness. I need attention. I need somebody to give me their love. I need somebody to give me their time. That neediness is never going to allow me to be content. Um, so I see how insecurity, because I don't have that recognition of my own value, and that state of self-esteem, then I'm very insecure, I'm fearful. There's so many things that happen because of this loss of identity of the inner being, of the true self. And if you think about the neediness of people, you think about the insecurity, you think about the fears that people have today, it's all absolutely connected with this lack of recognition of the self. And for Brahmins also, of course I know I'm a soul, I've been told I'm a soul five times in the Murli today already, or even seven times in the Murli. Well, listening to it is one thing. Repeating it in words is another thing. But feeling it and being it is something else. And if I, the soul, am actually in that consciousness of my own value and my own worth, then I don't need somebody to praise me, to say, you are wonderful, or... Um, you know, somebody to acknowledge that what I did was amazing. You know, I've done what I needed to do out of love for Baba, and Baba sees it. And whether others acknowledge it or not, it's okay. Never mind. And maybe later on, they will acknowledge, but I'm not even waiting for that. But that neediness for that recognition from outside is a drain. It really is because it's creating a lot of waste thoughts in my mind. And so I have to learn to be stable in my own state of dignity. And I'm sure that this is part of why Baba was able to be so powerful and absolutely stable, because Baba acknowledged who he is and acknowledged I am to be Narayan, acknowledged that, yes, I am Nimit. God has chosen me for this task. And that's how Baba became number one. And so following in the Father's footsteps, definitely, absolutely, that recognition of the inner being, you know, in that first step, renunciation. Well, the renunciation to God. I'm, who am I renouncing all this for? It's to be able to connect with God. And so I don't need any of those things. I just need to be in that awareness of the three things that that used to say, Om Shanti 1, who am I? Om Shanti 2, who do I belong to? Om Shanti 3, what do I need to do? So Baba was totally aware of this all the time. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, gentlemen. So uh, just one or two questions um, from chat. Uh, this is on. This is as a result of last week's discussion, when we talked about the drama being merged in the point. So this person is asking, why does Baba say that even if the entire ocean is converted to ink, the forest into paper, that this knowledge cannot be completely written, while the entire drama is merged in a tiny point. <laughs> This is the beauty that, yes, um, if you, even just today's morally, if you just think about Brahma Baba's life and all the things associated with the five different points, you wouldn't be able to summarize that in just a few words. It's so much, so much, so much, so much. And so God sharing knowledge with us all the way from um, Karachi days and gradually clarifying it, defining it and um, summarizing it. All of that has happened in the last 84 years. So slowly, 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 the ocean really, a huge amount has been shared. 
And yet, then Baba will say, you can summarize it all in three dots, soul and God and drama. And yes, everything is merged within these three things. So this is the paradox. And just as, you know, when there's um, the discussion about what is light, is light in waves or is light in rays? And it's both. It's rays, but it's also waves. And so God is the ocean and God is also just a point. And so drama is unlimited, but the unlimited drama can also be summarized in just a point. Thank you. Um, it's a little bit of a trick for the intellect to juggle with. You know how sometimes people can grasp one thing, but it's difficult for them to relate it in another way. Mm. And you need to have an agile intellect, light and easy and clear and then it can move from this aspect to that aspect because it is both. It's not just one. Yeah, and that's the beauty of our knowledge. Uh, just last question. Um, why do we deceive ourselves thinking that we have accumulated a lot, but actually we have not, according to Baba? Um, it's easy to think that, well, I've done so much service, I've been talking to so many people, I've given so many the course, or I've done so much for Baba in terms of finance. If I think on that external level, then that's deception. Um, but the mirror that comes in front of me is, am I content? Am I happy? Am I able to feel full? and fulfilled and that state of contentment will tell me yes things are right things are going as they should and I'm not deceiving myself and if I'm not happy and content and so on and so on that's a very clear indication that <coughs> I am deceiving myself so that will tell me Right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Gentlemen's uh, little body was not so well, but uh, she adjusted and gave us her time. So a big thank you to you. Thank you to everyone. And now after this, we will be transmitting uh, Sister Mohini's class in Madhuban. It's 6 p.m. now in Madhuban. And so just stay on if you want to listen to that. And the same translations will continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Om Shanti. Thank you. Om Shanti. Together.
Oh, Shanti, thank you.